No one is listening. Why am I wasting my time? So I don't think you are listening. I don't think anyone is listening. I don't think the nation is listening. And certainly I don't think any single one of you politicians have listened, nor cared, nor want to care. You're a turntable. You walk in, you walk out. You walk the walk, you talk the talk, and you're just here for show. Look, it's an issue. You can't hide it, it's, and you can't gloss over it. It's, it's what it is, it's what it is. And if you, if you mess with it, you don't get the message across. I'm Steve Matthews. I'm a farmer from Lockhart in New South Wales, a farmer grazier, and I've been on the on the land all my life, but I've had other interests as the well. The Lockhart area is a bit under a thousand people in total in the district. It's a farming area. It has changed recently, or when I say recently, over the last 20 or so years with a lot of farms being gobbled up by bigger farms. So there's less people in the district, or on the land anyway. Uh, my name's Chris Wilson. I, uh, I live at Oivy at Wanda Badgery, which is uh, 40 kilometres east of, uh, of Wagga. Uh, we run crossbred ewes here, and we join them to Dorset rams and breed a prime lamb. And then we, uh, we also grow a bit of canola, some wheat, uh, barley and lupins. I could be at the farm here all day and possibly not even get a phone call. The only person I'll see is my wife when I go home at night. Um, and I'm just one of many. Some guys are even more isolated than I am in that they haven't got a wife to go home to. Um, they spend 10, 12, 15, 20 hours on a tractor um, during the seasons. and. Uh, yeah, it's a long time to have nothing but your own thoughts. You're, you're not only physically isolated, but you're actually socially isolated. And um, then you become mentally isolated as well. Mental isolation is probably the precursor to depression. Start looking inward uh, uh, rather than outward. And then your, your psyche gradually spirals downwards there if you're not careful. The starting point of my depression for me was um, back in 1991, my little brother Matt and I were farming, uh, we were feeding some cattle and uh, he had an accident, he died. I was about two weeks away from going overseas, backpacking and all the rest. And we got, we got back onto our lives again, you know, a month or six weeks later. And we, so I resumed my intentions to travel. We went away for 12 months and when I came home, I realised that I hadn't grieved. I thought I was grieving when I went away, but I realised that I hadn't grieved. And the shock that uh, I went through, that, gosh, I'm still gotta, I've still got to go through this grieving process and I could see what my parents looked like, it absolutely frightened the pants off me. And so I shut it out. And uh, I made the decision that I'd, uh, I didn't want the world to know that I was in pain and that uh, I would save my grieving for another day and just put on a happy face and, and get out in the community and pretend everything was all right. on the top of my game, I had a, had a brilliant memory. I didn't need a phone book. All my contacts were in my head. Uh, I knew exactly the position of the business and the farm financially. When things went bad, lost some memory. So a lot of that stuff went. I lost my decision making and I lost my concentration. So once you do that, it's very hard to function. Um, so I was, I was rolling along with all that going on. 
my my experience of depression was was wholly internal. So I personally um, I didn't take anything out on anyone. I I was probably lazy with myself in not enacting on my mental health issues, and I internalised it. Some people do sort of you know they um, they might be self harming or they might be bullies or look I don't know. There's there's a lot of ways you can express it, but personally for me I just internalised it and just about drove myself nuts. You find that your behaviour changes initially, the anger rises, your, your concentration drifts, and then you start trying to compensate for them. The more you try to compensate, or the, the worse it gets, because it, for some reason you, you take on a feeling of I'm not coping uh, and that feeds on itself, and then I'm not coping with not coping, and off, off it goes. Uh, from being moderately depressed or minor, having minor depression, uh, it can very rapidly escalate to I'm bloody worthless, I'm a burden on my family, I shouldn't be here. Um, and that's, that's the progression really, is uh, uh, you know, from feeling, oh, you know, I really don't feel like getting up this morning to to that uh, can happen in a matter of weeks or months. I actually didn't ask for help. I was tripped up by my sister and, and uh, she recognised that I had a problem. But by that stage, I was over it. I just, I was over living my life. I just couldn't go on living it the way I was. She queried me and said, you know, what's wrong? And I can distinctly remember having like an out-of-body experience saying, saying to her, I think I'm depressed, I need help, can you help me? And yeah, and at the same time, I was totally frightened because I'd let the cat out of the bag for the first time. It's the first time I'd ever told anyone that I had an issue. And uh, I remember I was thinking, geez, what am I gonna do now, you know? I've gotta, I've gotta do something. And she immediately said, look, this'll be fine. We'll, we'll just book you into a psychologist and we'll do something. In fact, we might do it now. And, uh, and I actually said to her, yeah, sure, righto, great. But hang on a sec, I'll just go and grab my phone out of the ute. And uh, I ran and jumped in the ute and took off. I was too scared, just frightened. I'd absolutely shit scared that I was now gonna, you know, that I had help all the way in front of me, it's all there, but I had to do something about it. Because I'd been paralyzed for years and years by this illness. Uh, with the inability to, you know, really do anything. And then here's my first opportunity to actually get help and I was too afraid, so I ran. The realise, for some, something in the back of my mind, the realisation that my family actually did need me, uh, while it wasn't prominent, I think it was there in the back of my mind. And uh, my preferred method was head on with a truck. That was the plan. And I gave up, I saw it when in a better days, I saw it as a, as a, as a real problem. And I gave up driving, mostly. But um, yeah, one day driving to Wagga, uh, I'd actually picked the truck out. And um, anyway, I, I turned back, I said, no, this poor bugger's got a family too. And that was probably the, the switch that turned it back the other way. Uh, because it wasn't just about me, it was, it was going to drag, drag another family involved and that, that wasn't fair. After my sister um, approached me and I admitted that I had a problem and then I took off uh, from the house, you know, she'd mentioned that, you know, I just needed to go and see a psychologist. And I actually started looking them up in the phone book, in the yellow pages. Um, and. Uh, and just, there was a line of them there. There was probably about six or eight psychologists in Wagga that I could have gone to see uh, at any stage and I couldn't bring myself to make a phone call. No way. So about three months after uh, my initial uh, conversation with my sister, she came into the kitchen in the morning and just said, I've locked all the doors and windows. You're not getting out. We're going to do something about this today. You're not going anywhere. And... Uh, Again, I was, you know, I was low after, you know, um, having a big weekend and, and um, I had no 
no way of fighting back or, you know, resisting her, you know, her motivation. So I just said, all right, let's do it. So we got the phone book out again and I pretty much, I knew what page to look up uh, because I'd looked at it so many times, yet I didn't really know any of the, the psychologists on there. I couldn't really bring myself to read anything about them. And I randomly picked a phone number, the, you know, whichever one my first, I think I locked my eye on to, and I rang up and um, we made an appointment. Uh, I can remember the, um, the woman on the other end of the line saying, you know, um, righto, we can't see you for two weeks. Uh, and who referred you? And um, I said, oh, geez, my sister. And, uh, and I remember this woman, she paused at the other end and said, God, are you going to be all right? And I said, yeah, no, thank you. I'm going to be fine. And I was pretty excited that, you know, finally I was going to be able to go and see someone and get myself on the road to recovery. And uh, I remember hanging up the phone and, and um, I looked at my sister and said, you saved my life. Yeah. She did. And uh, it's the best day of my life. Mm. I don't think the nation is listening, and certainly I don't think any single one of you politicians have listened, nor cared, nor want to care. You're a turntable. You walk in, you walk out. You walk the walk, you talk the talk, and you're just here for show. My name's Helen Bender. I'm, uh, I guess, a daughter of a father who took his life and um, we're from uh, what used to be called the Darling Downs. It's now the Surratt Basin because it's, a, you know, it's all about gas now. It's not about the farmer. And so that's four hours from Brisbane. So we've, we've got a number of farms in Chinchilla. It's very um, intensive, broad acre farming. We're not irrigators, so it's dry land cotton, your wheat, your hog, your sorghum, your barley mung beans, whatever the commodity is at the time. So that's sort of, you know, the farm itself. In terms of the family, there's uh, obviously, there was mum and dad. Um, they'll be married, should have been married 50 years this year in August. And then there was five children. There was four brothers, Neil, Tony, Brian and Gary, and myself, I'm the last. The farm in which I grew up on, that property was bought by my grandparents in 1940. So he's been there since 1947. The house that I grew up in is the house that was built in time for dad to come home from the hospital in. And he never left. You know, he did one year of boarding school, but he lived his entire life in one house on one property. So the gas companies approached us, it would have been around 2000 and 2005. And that's one company. And then comes the next company. And then you would say around 2010, things, probably even nine, things started escalating more in that Origin were coming onto the scene. We knew Origin was coming onto the scene in about 2006, but they came on, they did their seismic activities and then they just disappear and you never know. So there's always this anxiety of when are they coming back? But then we had the link energy situation, which was the underground coal gasification, which is about six kilometres from the property um, as the birds fly. And what we were getting then was um, really unusual, toxic odour event. Pigs were dying. Um, there was really uh, distressing scenes on the farm. So um, he went public with it. He then, uh, Peter Bond challenged him. Um, sent him legal letters in terms of, he, you know, he's been vexatious and he'll be sued, all those types of things. Because Dad was doing a lot of media work with regards to the link situation in Chinchilla, um, the community started calling Dad um, a Hollywood star. So he was being sort of teased and bullied for being, you know, in the media talking out about what was actually happening. And I didn't know that until um, basically, yeah, he was on his deathbed. And I think that really hurt him. I think for the people in the community who knew Dad, I think it's, well, essentially their, their hands are stained with blood because they didn't support, they didn't stand beside him, they didn't, they didn't give him that, um, the fact that 
he had the community behind him. He, he felt like he was alone. I don't look at dad as having a mental illness because to me, an illness is something that's internal to oneself. What happened to dad was an injury. It was everything that was external to him. The difference is he would have recovered. Then, um, so once we had this awful land liaison officer, he, he basically was saying to dad, we'll just do whatever we want. Like we're coming on, ask your local members. We're allowed to do this. We're gonna do whatever we want to your place. I think he was just dumbfounded, you know, like he realised that he's fought 10 years to keep these people off his land and then it was either selling or signing or go to court were kind of really his options. That was basically was the tipping point, I would, I would actually say, on, with Dad. It, it was seeing his family caught up in this mess that he couldn't fix. Dad didn't die, obviously, um, immediately. Like, there was about 28 hours from the time he um, took his life to when he died. Um, it was a brain snap moment of, I'm out. Took the poison and then went, oh shit, what have I done? And it was an instant panic. He tried to, you know, he was trying to reverse the whole, what he just did. It was a brain snap moment. Yeah, by the time they got him to Brisbane though, um, I don't think they had time to get him onto the dialysis and he passed. So he passed here in Brisbane, PA, about a bit after six o'clock in the evening on the 14th. We were about 20 minutes too late. 20 minutes. dad to do, not at all, not his character. The fact that a company was going to take a farm away from him, that was like ripping his heart out. To the people that are well, they need to understand that, you, uh, that mental illness is not contagious. You will not catch a mental illness if you are someone Thank you.